are all standing. Um, so I don't have to ask, so that's good. Um, we stand because uh, this, is, this is the word of God. <laughs> that's big. That's heavy. Um, and it's actually something that I struggle a lot with, um, reading um, the Bible like, consistently. And uh, it's a practice that I'm trying to implement more in my life. And so last week, I was doing the old tried and true, like, flip method, you know? <laughs> you just kind of read whatever you come across. And I came to Mark uh, chapter 12. And Jesus is teaching uh, this crowd. And there's this verse in there that says, and the crowd listened to him with great delight. And another translation said, uh, deep delight. And it just jumped out at me. Um, we get to have a relationship with the Lord, um, and we don't have to wait until heaven to have that. And I grew up in a Pentecostal background. Like, I think God speaks in a myriad of ways, but this is one that we know for absolute sure that these are the words of God, and they don't return void. Like, they, they go right to the heart. Um, and so I think that's, that's why we stand um, here t- when we read the word. Um, and we listen with great delight. So we're going to read in uh, John chapter 4. We're going to pick up um, very briefly in John chapter 3, the last verse. So you can flip to that, or you can share with a neighbor, or pull out your phone, or just listen. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went once uh, more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of land uh, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him as he would have given you the living water. Sir, said the woman, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him like a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water (laughs) so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What he have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what we do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? 
Then, leaving her water jug, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of town and made their way towards him. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. That you are someone who comes and will sit down with us and offer us living water. Lord, you see the one. You make time out of uh, what we might think of a busy schedule. You're God of the universe. But you take the time to really see. Lord, we offer this time um, to hear and to obey. Um, And we just ask that when Bren comes up and preaches, Lord, that those words uh, will go deep within our hearts. Lord, and that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers also. We come to you with deep delight. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, so glad to see you all. This morning, my name's Ben, I'm one of the pastors here. We have Bibles for you if you didn't bring one, don't have one. Uh, Michael and Lucy are coming down the aisles. If you'd like one, just slip your hand up. Um, those are our gifts to you if you'd like to take that home. We love to give away Bibles here. Um, if, if you're new here, especially, or you know, maybe even exploring Christianity, we are thrilled that you're here. Um, we... That's, you're the reason that we exist. Uh, we want for, for us to be a safe place for you to come and learn about Jesus. Um, my, uh, my family is expecting a baby soon. We, we got like less than two weeks, week and a half. Um, and it's about time. <laughs> uh, I am ready. I am ready. Yeah. And I need to go on a diet, too. I... I, uh, for whatever reason, whenever Tiffany gets pregnant, I gain massive amounts of weight. Um, every time I like get in a contest with her to see who can gain the most weight. Um, and I actually beat her one time um, <laughs> by a few pounds. Not this time, but close. Um, anyway, I, yeah, it's, we're excited. I wasn't sure if I was going to be preaching today. Um, we were like Friday. It was it felt like maybe, she was like, maybe today might be the day. Um, anyway, so like I am super excited, but also really, really glad that she, she didn't go into labor because I'm really excited about this message this morning. Um, we are a, a church about uh, helping as many people as possible find and follow Jesus. That's our mission. That's everything that we do from, from every song that we sing, every, every sermon that you'll hear here. Um, our community groups, our alpha groups, what we do in kids' ministry, everything we do is to this end that we want to help as many people as possible find and follow Jesus. So if you're here and you aren't yet a follower of him, then we are here to help you find him. And if you are a follower of Jesus, we want to help you follow him well. Um, That's what we exist for. And um, We've started a series called Made for More, and uh, two weeks ago, we learned that we were made for word and spirit. You can go back and listen to any of our messages online. Um, Last week, Aaron preached uh, just an awesome message on on the gospel, that we were made for love, Uh, a great, incredible presentation of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And this morning, our sermon is... Um, specifically going to look at the fact that we were made for true worship. And we're going we're gonna to get, a, hopefully, a better idea of what, what that means. Um, so we just read this incredible story in, in John 4. There's a lot of verses. It's just an amazing story, and it's packed with so much treasure there. But, but as you heard, it's this story about Jesus meeting this woman and and steering this conversation with her in such a way that she ends up becoming a follower of his. And she actually leads 
like most of her town, to become followers of Jesus. Um, and so it's, it's, an, it's an awesome story. Um, the, the thing that I want to show you this morning is that this story is incredibly relevant to all of us. So wherever you land, whether you're a follower of Jesus already, not there yet, this story has great relevance to you. Um, and we're going we're gonna to see exactly why. But pray with me one more time before we just jump in. Father, I just want to acknowledge that I need you, that no, no words of mine can do any good in any human heart apart from your spirit at work. And so, Father, um, I ask that hearts would be soft and pliable in your hand and that your word would go forth in power and that you would change our lives as a result of it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so look at verse number 10. Um, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Um, the premise of this message is that we are all, we are all in in a relentless search for soul satisfaction. I want you to think about this. Every decision that you make in your life is with that end in mind, that you would, that you would be satisfied. Even when you do something self-sacrificing, um, every decision that you make in life is to the end that you want soul satisfaction. You were made to find that. So even the little decisions in life, everything from uh, the, the restaurant that you go out to eat uh, or, or the career that you decide to pour your life into, every decision that you make, you are driven by this relentless pursuit of joy, soul satisfaction. Um, the invitation that Jesus gives to this woman is to drink water that he can give to her, this living water that will satisfy her, that, that will cure her thirst. What is the living water that can quench her thirst forever? Well, the answer, very simply, the answer is God. We were made before sin ever entered into the picture, we were made for a relationship with God. Adam and Eve, the first human beings, walked with God in the cool of the day. They, they got to experience what we were all made for, a real experiential relationship, an unbroken relationship with the living God. That is what you were made for. That's what we are all ultimately searching for. God is the water that satisfies our souls. The, um, the gospel, which means good news, is, is the news that we can have that relationship with God. The gospel explains how we can get to him, how we can have that relationship, that friendship with him. What the gospel tells us is that there is a problem, and the reason that we don't already have that, that relationship with God is because we are sinful. We are rebellious against God. That from Adam and Eve on, every single person has gone their own way, has rebelled against God, has sinned against God, and run away from him. And the the penalty of our sin is death and separation from God. And so we don't have that, that relationship, that friendship with God. And the good news about Jesus is that Jesus Christ made a way for that to be restored. Jesus is the only way, the one and only way, that a person can come into a relationship with God. A person can have their sins forgiven and be restored to God. How did that come about? Well, Jesus came to earth 
He is the Son of God. He came to earth, became a man, and lived a perfect and sinless life. He never rebelled. He never sinned against the Father. And then he went to the cross. He died a a brutal death on a cross and took our sins upon himself. He took our rebellion upon himself. He took the, the wrath of God, the payment for our sins was paid by him. He died on the cross, absorbing our sin, absorbing the wrath of God in our place. He was buried in a garden grave, a huge stone rolled over the entrance to this grave. And then on the third day, an angel came and rolled that stone away, and Jesus walked out. He rose bodily. He defeated sin and death. And this is the crux of our faith. This is what it all comes down to for us. We believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God, lived the sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and then rose from the grave. And that is the good news about Jesus. And we all who believe in him and in what he accomplished for us, when we trust him and what he did for us, can have our sins, our rebellion wiped out, clean, forgiven, and we can be restored to friendship with God. Now, that's the water, the living water. The living water is God himself, and that's the way we get to that living water, is through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. So coming back to our story, we see this amazing picture of Jesus, who is the friend of sinners, which is really good news for me. It's really good news for you too. Jesus Christ sits down with this woman, and he doesn't berate her. He doesn't condemn her. He leads her to himself. It's an incredible interaction. He gives her a way out of the bondage that she's been living in. So Jesus wants to give this Samaritan woman water that will forever satisfy her. And then in verse 15, she asks him for it. She doesn't exactly know yet what this is, but she asks him for it. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. Now, the question that that we should ask ourselves is, if Jesus wants to give her this water, he's telling her about it, and then she says, okay, give me that water, would Jesus then change the subject? And lead her down a different path. No, no. So then why does he take the conversation where he does? Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. The one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Why does Jesus do this? Why does he bring up the man that she's living with that she isn't married to? Why does does he bring up her her past? She's just asked for living water, Jesus. Why don't just give her the living water? This is precisely the path that he must lead her down in order for her to find living water. And that's the key to this passage that I want you to understand. She must see the way she has forsaken God and turn to other things for satisfaction first. He does this very intentionally and out of love for her. Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is why this story is so relevant to all of us this morning. Because this is what we all 
do. We all do this. We all go to other things apart from God to try and find our soul's satisfaction. We all continually do this, and we need God's grace to show us and bring us back to himself, to the fountain of living water, so that our souls can find their true satisfaction in him. God is what we're all searching for. He's the living water our souls are panting for. So, this woman, this woman was looking for happiness through her relationships, right? And so, relationship after relationship ended, and her soul was never satisfied. This is the sto- her story, right, of, of life without God. This is her story. But we all have a without God story, don't we? Even, even those of us who have been walking with him for a while, don't we at times do this? Don't we hew out cisterns for ourselves and try and find our soul satisfaction in other places? Always looking for happiness, this, this woman had been let down again and again and again and again. So, where have you looked for your soul's satisfaction apart from God? What are your broken cisterns that hold no water? Is it your career? Is it the accumulation of wealth? Or your your influence? Is it your next new adventure? Or relationships like this woman? Or even just your friends? Is it pornography? Or lust? Is it sexual sin? Alcohol? Drugs? Involvement in the occult? Is it your kids? Your grandkids? Is it your pet? Your sexual orientation? Your weekend plans? Is it social activism? Is it entertainment? Like movies or social media or YouTube or video games? Whatever it is that you attempt to satisfy your soul with apart from God will leave you empty. It's a broken cistern that can hold no water. Now, if you felt yourself getting a little uncomfortable when I mentioned one or more of these things, then you have a little idea of what this woman at the well felt like, right? (laughs) Only, Only Jesus just goes right to her, her sin. And you see how she wants to change the subject pretty quickly right after Jesus, Jesus brings up her boyfriend, right? Verses 19 and 20. The woman said to him, you can almost hear her clear in her throat. <coughs> I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship a good move, (laughs) right? Throw him a curveball. Let's change the subject. What's she doing? Well, she would rather keep the conversation strictly religious, right? And aren't we a little bit like that? Like, hey, I came here because my friend invited me, but it's been a little awkward in here. I thought this was just like religious thing. Y'all are getting real personal. But that's exactly what Jesus does. That's exactly where life change happens. Right? We we don't we don't just gather here cuz this is fun. We don't just come do this every week because 
it feels good. No, we, we actually believe that Jesus is a real Savior and friend who is leading us, and we are following him as our king. And so that means he's going to put his finger on some things now and then and make us feel a little squirmy so that we actually change. And that's what he's doing here. Commentator Mary Elizabeth Baxter said, This was the open wound. This was the sore point. This was the sinful thing which needed setting right. There is no true conversion until the Lord Jesus has laid his finger upon the sore place, the source of sin within. Ah, so true. So my question for you this morning, or the question that you should be asking yourself is, what's the sore place in me? What's the source of sin in me? Was there something that really made you squirm this morning? Or that is just in the back of your head that you can't stop thinking about? What's the thing you've been pursuing in place of God, hoping it would satisfy your thirsty soul? Here is the point that I'm getting at. Just as Jesus does with this Samaritan woman. He wants to walk you down the path to seeing the idols in your life, the things in your life that you have used to satisfy your soul instead of God so that he can lead you to living water. Um, why is this necessary? Why is it necessary that we deal with this, this brokenness in us, this, the uncomfortable stuff? Because the truth is we'd rather ignore it, wouldn't we? And that's what we try to do. But the fact of the matter is we cannot drink from empty cisterns and a fountain of living water. We can't. It's one or the other. And we think we can do both. We think we can go back and forth. We can't. And Jesus knows this. And he knows this for this woman, and he knows it for you and for me. We need to find these places in our lives that we have lived apart from God and deal with them and be done with them. Another way that the Bible talks about these broken replacements for the true God in our lives is idolatry. Idolatry. Um, an idol is a false god, anything in our lives that takes the place of God. When we think of idols, we tend to think of like physical idols, right? Like false gods that have been formed and that people bow down to. In other cultures, that's not something we deal with, but actually we do. We, ha we have idols. An idol is anything in your life that is taking prominence, that is, that is getting in the place of God. It's taking the place of God. So an idol in your life could be anything off that list from earlier. It could be, it could be your TV or your phone. I mean, it could, be, it could be your leisure and entertainment, pleasure. It could be food. It could be, it could be healthy living. Anything that you're living for. That's what an idol is. So, what do we do? And if you're, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, like, what's, like, honestly, what's the big deal? I want to help you out. This is why it's a big deal. Because true Christians, true followers of Jesus are worshipers of God. That is the end of everything that we do in life, is that we worship the one true God. John Piper says, missions exists because worship doesn't. In other words, the end of all missions is worship. We go to the ends of the earth 
We go to new peoples with the gospel because they do not worship him. And God's heart is that they would. And his heart is that we would. We were not saved by Jesus so that we could add this whole Christianity thing to our lives like a topping. This is to become our whole lives. L- listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.15. Jesus died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. He died so that you would live your whole life for him. Your whole life. He died not only to purchase your forgiveness, but also to purchase your freedom from every sin. He died to purchase your worship. He bled on a cross. He was spit on and mocked and beaten and rejected. And he took all of our sins upon himself so that we would worship him. And so our response should be nothing less than to ruthlessly seek out the idols in our lives of disobedience and destroy them. Tear them down. That is what a life of following Jesus looks like. And it's a constant, it's not like like week one of following Jesus, I get rid of all my idols, and then the rest of the time it's just me and him, like holding hands, they come back and like new ones pop up or you find out like, oh, that was an idol that I've had for years and I didn't even know it. This is a lifelong pursuit to destroy the idols in your life so that you can worship. You say, I thought this was all just like a by faith thing. Like, what does this all really matter? We believe and then Well, real faith changes you. Genuine faith is accompanied by obedience. The very first verse that we read today in the ESV says, in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The first time I read that, I was like, whoa, I got to look up the original Greek on that because that cannot be a good translation. No, it's a good translation. That's exactly what John the Baptist said. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We expect him to say after that, whoever does not believe in the Son does not have life. But he switches it up. He says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Now, what in the world is he saying there? He is saying that those who believe will obey. Think about what you're saying when you say, I believe in Jesus, I trust him. Think about what you're saying. And then he says, okay, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm, nah. No, but I trust you. I believe you. Right? Think about it. When you genuinely trust him and believe in him, your life will be marked by obedience. It's not perfect obedience. I can testify to that. But it is a trajectory of obedience, of growing obedience, of a heart for obedience, that you are broken when you don't obey. You repent when you don't obey. This is one of the verses that God used to awaken me and 
when I became a Christian. I was just scouring the, the, the scriptures to understand what, what this gospel was, what, what Jesus was about. And I came across this verse, and I was stunned. And then I read Matthew 7, 21 through 23. From the, the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Oh. I saw that and I thought, that's me. As a junior in college, I, I said, that is me. If I were to be standing before Jesus right now, that's exactly me. To trust in Jesus is to give him access to all of you, your whole life. We love to compartmentalize our lives, don't we? We love to be just like the woman at the well. Let's not talk about the uncomfortable thing. You know, we think that worship should be over here, and you guys say worship should be here. Let's talk about that. Isn't that what we do? But God loves you more than just to leave you right there. This morning, you're here because he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants to walk you down that path, that uncomfortable path to see that thing that is stopping you from being a true worshiper of God. So, we give him all the access to our life. We find out where are the idols of disobedience in our lives, and we, by faith, tear them down. Why, why do I say by faith? Because you cannot do this in your own strength. By faith, you trust in God. You trust him and you say, help me. I can't tear this thing down. Help me. I trust you. Give me the strength to do this and he will. And so by faith, you tear down the idol in your life or the idols in your life. And then secondly, you replace your idols with true worship. The way to drink from the fountain, the way for your soul to be satisfied is through worship. And so we, we don't just stop with tearing down the idols. We go another step further. Um, a soul that is satisfied in God won't go back to idols, won't keep looking for idols. Again, listen to, to commentator Mary Elizabeth Baxter. She says, everyone who drinks continually of the water which Jesus gives, ceases to thirst for the world's pleasures or for anything which it has to give. God is their satisfying portion. So, you tear down the idols and then you want to be done with that craving for that idol, so what do you do? You go worship God because he will satisfy your soul. You ever been so full that you just can't eat another bite that's what this is like. It's only happened to me like twice. It was on Thanksgiving both times. That's what this is about. Your soul being so satisfied by the one that created you, by the one that you were made for, that sin and every idol loses its allure. You, 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 don't, you don't feel any urge for anything but God. So we tear down the idol and we worship the one true God. There's a story in the Old Testament about a, a guy named Gideon. Judges 6, um, God chooses this guy to become a mighty warrior. And, and the first assignment that he gives Gideon is to tear down the, the physical idols in his own town. These massive idols that are in the middle of his town. But God's instructions don't stop with that. Listen to what God tells him. Judges 6, 25 through 26. That night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second 
bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you cut down. I love that. Take, take the idol that you just cut down, chop it up and burn it in order to offer a sacrifice of praise to me. He says, after you're done tearing down the idols, I want you to build an altar of worship to me right on top of it. Why? Because God wants our idols torn down so that we will worship Him. We don't stop with rooting these things out of our lives. We build stone by stone an altar of worship on top of the ruins of our idols. How do we do that? Well... Romans 12, 1 tells us, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How do we worship? We present ourselves totally to God, completely. God, I am all yours. I am all yours. Do with me whatever you want. Whatever job you want me in, I'm there. Whatever city you want me living in, I'm there. Whoever you want me to marry, done. However many kids you want us having, done. It might be a lot. <laughs> That's, this, is how you, this is how you worship. You worship by laying your life out on the altar and saying, I am all yours, all of me, my free time, yours. My savings, yours. My hobbies, yours. My family time, yours. It's all yours. I am just here to worship you. And guess what the result is? You end up having more joy than you could ever imagine. We, we run away from that life because we're afraid of it, because we think it's this huge sacrifice. And guess what? It is a sacrifice and it is greater joy than you can ever experience any other way. We build true worship on top of the stronghold of our idols. We find what these things are, the things that are giving us our identity, the things that are giving us our satisfaction in life are not God, and we say, I'm done. God is my fountain. This is what it means to worship in spirit and truth. But more than that, what does it mean to worship in truth? Well, it means that we don't pick and choose our, you know, theology like a buffet line from the Bible. We don't go through here and say, I like that, and I like that, and I don't like that. So, you know, I think this is the new heresy of our day, is this DIY spirituality that says, you know, I, I, look, my friends come here, so I'm here. Worship's pretty good. Don't really agree with what you believe about this or that, but that is not genuine Christianity. It's not. God has called us to yield, to give our, our, to lay ourselves down on the altar and say, you are God and I am not. You know best and not me. And that is what it is to worship in truth. True worshipers, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Where do we know what truth is? Jesus said in John 17, 17, in his prayer to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Every bit of it. 
So, I think it's an encouragement that our Father is looking for true worshipers. Like He's just waiting. He is just waiting for you to yield, to say, I'm done, I'm done. Done my way. It's your way, God. And He says, yes, I've been waiting. I've been seeking true worship from you. Ah. So does this include singing songs? Yes, absolutely. First Chronicles, in, in First Chronicles 16, it says, Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. So yes, it is singing, it is music, but it is so much more. It's a life that is presented to God as a sacrifice. I want to I finish with a story. Tuesday, um, I was studying this passage, and I was soaking in this passage. And in particular, I was, I was meditating on this, on the fact that... Um, that Jesus had to walk this Samaritan woman down the path of her seeing her idols in order for her to be led to living water. I was just thinking about that. And um, that afternoon, I was struck with this crazy feeling of discontentment. And, uh, and I, I did, like, it seemingly came out of nowhere. Like, I just felt really discontent. Um, so after a while, after like a couple of hours of just like trying to pretend that it wasn't there and shrug it off, I was like, okay, I need to like get some clarity about this. And so I sat down and I started to write. And as I wrote in conversation with the Lord, um, I began to see that what, what I was longing for was a new challenge. Like I wanted a new hill to climb. My whole life, I've, I've, lo- I've loved new situations. Like, as a kid, even, I wanted to rearrange my room every year or so because I couldn't stand for it to just be the same. I needed, like, a new, look, a new room. That's, that's who, who I am. And, and my whole life, I've thrived in challenges and in, in new situations. And so... When things become routine, I get uncomfortable. I start itching for the next hill. And um, God was giving me some clarity about this. And I was, that he was saying to me, you know, or I was coming to the realization, I am discontent because I am thirsting for a new adventure. And as I sat there and processed that, trying to be honest before the Lord. I'm working on like being emotionally honest before God and not like just bringing my false self to him. Anybody else, anybody else ever do that? So I'm like, okay, okay, God, I know this isn't right, but like this is where I'm at. I'm, this is what I'm thirsting for. And he brings this great clarifying thought into my mind. I am a friend of the living God. That's who I am. And that means I am called to walk in experiential daily life with him. And there is no greater adventure than that. Right in the middle of, you know, cleaning up the house and washing dishes and work and meetings and the everyday routine stuff of life, the living God wants to walk with me. He wants to speak to me every day through his word. He wants to correct me and point out sin that I need to repent of. He wants to discipline me when I get off track. And there is no greater adventure 
on the planet than that. <laughs> and so he showed me that this soul thirst for adventure that I had was found in him. Just like every other soul thirst that you have, they all find their satisfaction in him. And I sat there after this great revelation, suddenly realized that Jesus had just done for me exactly what he did for the woman at the well. He just walked me down the path, showed me this idol in my life, said, you, you need to deal with that. Uh, he led me to living water, but he had to take me down the path of seeing my sin, the place that had to be made right. All of our souls thirst. We thirst for, for purpose. We thirst to be loved. We thirst to belong. We thirst to be challenged. We thirst for joy and on and on and on and on. And all these thirsts ultimately find their satisfaction in walking in friendship with God. That's what it means to live a life of true worship.